Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2. We'll be looking this morning at a tale of two kings, and uh, I'm going to read from uh, chapter 2, the first uh, 12 or so verses there, to give us the background. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who was born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard of it, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time that the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. And having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this Christmas Sunday morning. And Lord, in this passage, we see the announcement of your son's birth. We see the time in which he was born, a wicked and an evil time, with a wicked and evil despot as a ruler. And Lord, we see the, the two kings that are, appear on the pages of Holy Scripture. We thank you, Lord, that your son has come with his kingdom, to be victorious over sin and death, that we might have eternal life. And so, Father, we thank you for this day that we can rejoice, we can praise you, we can glorify you this Christmas Sunday morning. We pray that you might be exalted, that your word might go forth clearly, that we might see our own selves in this story this morning. For we pray in Christ's name, and all of God's people said, I know our perennial favorite to watch, we haven't watched it yet, but uh, we will watch it within the next couple of days, is The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, right? How many of yours, that's at least ranks in the top five of, of the Christmas stories? Really? That low? Okay. I guess we're just that weird. It is one of our perennial favorites to watch during the holiday seasons, and uh, we all have our favorite parts in the show, different times in the show. Um, we, we, since he's not here today, he's sick, uh, we always talk about David when they, you know, they, he's a mean one, Mr. Grinch, you know, and we're like, yeah, that's you, Dave, and, uh, and we go on throughout, and there's different ones at different places along the way. My favorite part, uh, portion of the show is when Max the dog, with his one antler, you know, tied to his forehead, he's struggling with the, the toy-laden sleigh up the mountainside, and he's just tottering there, right? And uh, that's, Max is my hero in the story. I love Max for, you know, for whatever reason. I'm a dog guy. But why is it that the Grinch is so appealing during a Christmas season? Why is it that we like that? We like to watch those pleasant movies uh, during the Christmas season. Possibly it's because in the vein of Dickens' Christmas Carol, the Grinch prominently displays the power of conversion that comes about as a result of Christmas. It displays the power of conversion. And, you know, I think also probably more than one family has a Grinch character in it, right? Yes, I think probably. Probably most all of us have a bit of Grinch within us as well. But I think that's part of the appeal is that there is a conversion of somebody that's really nasty to somebody that becomes really, really good. And it's hopeful, and it's pleasant, and it's appealing to us. And in the first Christmas story, you don't see that. There is a Grinch of a Grinch of a figure, and there is no conversion that happens with him, and that's one of the kings that we see. But fortunately, there are two kings 
that we see in the Christmas story here in the first couple of verses even. And so in Matthew chapter 2, we're going to read about this tale of two kings that appear here in the Christmas story. Uh, the original Grinch wasn't simply going out to steal the Whoville's presents. He was bound and determined to kill Christmas itself. This was King Herod. And the path of these two men, Herod and Christ, would converge in what I've called the tale of two kings. The one epitomizes the worst that humanity has to offer. Uh, cruelty, meanness, nastiness, vengefulness, bitterness, you know, all of that. The other, the best that God has to offer. The one epitomizes the worst that humanity has to offer. The other, the Lord Jesus, epitomizes the very best that God has to offer. Love, forgiveness, new life, new creation. And at the original Christmas, we see a conflict between the two kings. Two world systems, uh, two ways of living, two ways of looking at life. And my question this morning is, which king are you going to follow? Which one will you follow in the footsteps of? In Matthew chapter 2, as I said, we see the conflict between these two kings, one who brought Christmas and the one who was going to try to stamp it out at the very beginning. Let's take a look at this man who tried to kill Christmas long before there was a Grinch, long before there was uh, a Scrooge, there was a Herod. There was Herod. And King Herod was a man who attempted, as I said, to kill off the original Christmas even though he didn't even know the holiday existed, all right? We all know people who are against Christmas. I don't understand them, but I want to remind us this morning that there was a conflict between the birth of the Savior and a man who hated Christmas even, as I said, more than Scrooge and Grinch uh, combined. In fact, he attempted to kill the Savior. He, he attempted to kill the, the, uh, the Son of God himself. It's a strange, it's a bizarre story, that really doesn't fit so nicely into our hallmark Christmas, you know, season television programming. Amid all of our well wishes, our carols, our cards, our tinsels, our trees, our bright lights that seem to mark the season, there was in the original Christmas this, lo uh, this looming, ominous figure that wanted to stamp it out. And in verse 1, we notice the conflict is coming as the announcement of Christ's birth is directly tied to the reign of King Herod. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the days of, in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, we see it's being set up right at the very beginning of this chapter. Uh, sometimes we almost forget that Christ was born in a real place at a real time with all sorts of historical and political events that were going on, and not everybody was nice. In fact, there were a lot of nasty people. It was a nasty age to be living in. And Herod was no make-believe character. He was real. He was powerful. He was dangerous. He was paranoid. He was now very angry. He, as I said, hated Christmas, and he wasn't even a member of the ACLU, right? Satan hates Christmas. Satan's people hate Christmas. God's people rejoice in the coming of the Savior. God's people rejoice that God has given us new life and new opportunity with the coming of Christ. Herod the Great, as he was called, I think he should have been called Herod the Nasty, but nonetheless, they didn't ask me. Herod the Great, as he was named, was born into a politically well-connected family. At an early age, it was evident that he was destined for politics, hardball politics, they really seriously would make Pelosi and Schumer look like choir boys by comparison. At 25 years of age, he was made governor of Galilee in a region in a region that was, was just kind of an out-of-control backwoods uh, area of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Romans were hoping to take control of the area, and they saw in him a man that was so ruthless, so mean, so nasty that he could do it. And they proclaimed him king of the Jews. It was a title that every true religious Jew hated. They hated that. This man was no Jew. This man wasn't religious. He wasn't Jewish. He was an Edomite. He was hated by the, the Pharisees. He was hated by the Zealots. And it's interesting that his whole mission that we see in this passage is to kill the true king of the Jews. Herod had all the classic characteristics of a first-class villain. First-class villain. 
Disney couldn't have come up with a better one than this. First class villain, he was preoccupied with power. You know, the, the goal of politics is to secure power. The goal of politics is get your people elected. And, and Herod went a step beyond that. He said, nobody's going to elect me and nobody's going to take me down. And I'll kill anybody that tries to get in the way. He was addicted to power. Uh, oftentimes in the Bible, we see there's a direct connection between a, 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 a lust for power and something we call sin. Power is usually an attempt to secure one's destiny, to control one's destiny, to control those around them and their destiny so that my destiny can be what I want it to be. And if you notice, the letter I is right in the middle of sin. Herod's use of power can be summed up in three words. He was capable, he was crafty, and he was very, very cruel. He was undoubtedly uh, ca uh, capable. He had wiped out bands of guerrillas who were terrorizing the countryside. He'd used diplomacy to make peace among warring factions, but he was crafty as well. He arranged all of his relationships so that they were conduits of power to benefit him directly right down to several of his ten different marriages. He was a nasty, nasty individual. And as a result of his morbid distrust of anyone who might possibly aspire to take the throne from him, he was a cruel man. Over the years, he killed many, including his brother-in-law, mother-in-law, two sons, and at least one wife that we know of. He murdered out of spite, and he killed in order to keep his own power. He was barbaric. You know, maybe we're not as willing to take the same steps that Herod did, but we want what we want. We want to keep what we've got. We don't want anybody to get in the way of what we've got, and we're willing to usually step over the top or step on whoever might get in our way of keeping it. Herod had a preoccupation with his possessions as well. Uh, Herod would have done great in our time period. He simply wanted it all. He wanted everything. He, he wanted bigger, better, faster, more powerful, better looking, more influential. He wanted it all. He wanted everything that Caesar had, even though he was on a smaller budget. And so what did he do? He just raised taxes on everybody else. Because he was still going to get his, regardless of who it hurt. In a time and in a place when the populations were smaller, the opportunities to build and what they had for building with was more difficult. Herod had seven palaces, seven theaters, the average one with which would seat about 10,000 people. And here it is on the backside, as I said, of the Roman Empire, and he built a stadium that was two and a half times the size of Ohio State or Penn State's football stadiums. Two and a half times. Oh, they would seat about 300,000 fans. I mean, you think, you think, you know, Happy Valley is crazy, or the big house, or whatever else. 300,000 people at this time period. He, and that's how he got the name Great, was because of all this building projects. He had a preoccupation with prestige. He wanted to make a great impression on other people. He built cities. He built, as I said, stadiums. He built theaters. He built all these amenities. And then oftentimes he would name them after people who were more powerful than he so he could curry their favor. Isn't it interesting how we'll use things and try to use people for our benefit in life? Herod had a preoccupation with also his personal paranoia. I guess politics and paranoia go hand in hand, don't they? But ever since an enemy poisoned Herod's father, who was previous king, the despot took great care to make sure that nobody, nobody put anything in his soup or in his drink. Upon becoming king, uh, Herod built ten emergency fortresses, all heavily armed, all well stocked, in addition to all the, uh, the precautions in order to have a, a spy network that could sniff out and eliminate distance that would make the, you know, the Spesna look, look weak by comparison. We see Herod status quo was compromised by the coming of the true king. Herod thought he had it all. He thought he had it all under control. He thought if he just killed enough people, 
influenced enough people, intimidated enough people, he could live the type of life he wanted to live, and nothing and nobody could change that. Well, that status quo was going to be compromised by a coming king, and Herod was confronted with the coming of the new king. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. And behold, Magi from the east in Jerusalem arrived, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, with that background that I've just given you about Herod's personality, Herod's preoccupation with power and with prestige and his paranoia, what do you suppose he's going to do? Oh, gee whiz, another king has been born. Let's go and greet him. I don't think so. The news of the birth of the Messiah met Herod near the end of his reign, near the end of his life. And if you haven't noticed in politics, one thing that all politicians love to do, and it's the rare one that doesn't, is keep and stay in power. Right? 95% of United States congressmen and women, if they are elected after their second term, okay, after four years in office, if they are reelected after that, will stay in office until they retire. Why is that? They love power. They love power. And the Senate's just as bad, by the way. Uh, they love power. And with the money and with the power that's associated with that and what they can do for you or can do against you, uh, as a result of that, they can stay in power for just about as long as they want to. Now, the Magi or the wise men we read about here are coming. They're traveling from the east. They're being granted an interview with with Herod, and they ask him this question down in verse 9. And in verse 9, it says, And having heard the king, they went about on their way after this question to look and see the star where, the, where uh, it was seen in the east. They went before him and came and stood where the child was. Well, the old despot, when they, when they come and say, We want to know where this child is that's been born a king. He tells them, oh, please tell me so I can worship him too. Go find him for me. I'm sure he had a Cheshire cat grin on his face, right? Just thinking who it was and how he could find him so he could kill them. He'd killed all of his foes in the past, and there was, there was no more problem with killing a child in his mind than you and I would have with swatting a pesky fly at a 4th of July picnic. We need to go against the pride of status quo and allow Christ to reign in our lives. Each one of us, if we're living outside of Christ, if we haven't repented of our sins and asked Christ into our life, we are essentially saying that we're the king of our own lives and that we're going to live however we want to live and in whatever degree and whatever fashion we want to live and nobody and no one is going to change that for us. And you see... That's a choice that Herod could have had. Herod could have decided, well, who is this real king of the Jews? He knew his condition. He knew he wasn't a true king of the Jews. He knew that. But instead, his heart motivated him, let's go kill this one that they're talking about. You know today that you're not the ruler of your own life. You may think that you are. You may have done a good job trying to convince yourself that you are and that you have been. Maybe you think you've been for however many years you've been alive. You don't want to change the status quo. You want to keep it the same. But you know what? Your life's falling down around you. You need Christ. You need the Savior. Uh, your life, maybe not to the degree that we see in Herod, but without Christ, it's no different than Herod's life. You need Christ this morning, this Christmas Sunday morning. You remember there were other great kings in the history that God got the attention of. You remember one of the greatest kings of antiquity, a Babylonian king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? The book of Daniel talks a lot about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was proud, and he was arrogant, and he was emotional, and he was given to extremes. And God had told him, what would happen if he didn't repent and if he didn't humble himself? But one day, as most politicians, as most kings are, 
are able to do. He was wandering about, and he was going through his gardens, and he was looking around, and he said, my, oh, my, I am a great king. Wow, just look at all of this that I have done by my own hands. Wow, I can't believe what a great guy I am. You almost wonder if in his garden he didn't just have rows and rows of mirrors so he could look at himself, you know, like the old Mac Davis song, if you're old enough to remember that. And, and he would just go on and on. And God said, well, you know what? You're not as great as you think you are. He struck, struck down, goes around for about a year acting like a cow, acting like a goat eating, grazing in the fields. Can you imagine if you were his, you know, one of his inner sanctum of, of advisors, you know, what's the king doing today? Yeah, he's doing like the back 40. <laughs> he's mowing. Yeah, he's mowing. What do you mean he's mowing? Yeah, he's, he's eating again. And it talks about how his nails grew to be like eagle's claws and how his hair got all matted and long. And because why? Because he hadn't humbled his heart. He hadn't humbled his heart. You know what? That's all that God asks you to do. Humble your heart before him. Recognize that you're a sinner. Recognize what his provision for you is, that it's Jesus Christ. Recognize that it's this, the true king of Christmas that has come. Uh, you have, I have nothing in my spiritual standing before God Almighty that I can be proud of. But thank God I have everything that I can be grateful for in Christ. What's the sin that causes you the most trouble? If I were to ask you to write it down on a card, put it in the offering plate as it goes by, I am sure that I would get anger. I'm sure I would get people to write down that lust or lying or greed or materialism or some form of that. I'm sure that there would be people who would write down jealousy and hatred and gossip and laziness. I might get some others that would be included in that. But I don't know how many would write down pride. And probably because we are so proud that we want to convince ourselves that we're not even proud, right? We're so proud that we don't even think that we're proud, which demonstrates just how proud we really are. It is the one issue, it's the one of the sins that affects us probably in our lives nearly every single day. If you get angry, why do you get angry? You get angry because you want it your way, right? Uh, if, if it's because uh, you think that your real issue is, is, uh, is materialism or something like that, well, why is that? It's because you think you deserve more than you've got. Pride. C.S. Lewis called pride the great sin. Pride is at the root of even such things as lust. Why do you lust? Because you, again, think you deserve it. You think that person, you can use that person, I can use that person to fulfill my desire and not think of him or her as a true person, but just an object. That's called pride. Well, we see in Herod that he sought to kill what he thought was his competition. And in the passing of time, Herod attempted to find and destroy the Christ child. Jesus was born to be a king, but more importantly, Jesus was born a king. His salvation and his kingdom apply even to today's world and today's problems. His kingship had future implications. The sovereignty of Christ extends in an unbroken line throughout the ages, hidden from view now maybe, but he will come again according to the scripture in God's timing. And the Bible tells us that he will reign in righteousness forever and ever. Why? Because he is the true king of Christmas. He will come Again, according to the scriptures. And the wise men inquired, where is he who has been born the king? Today, wise people in troubled times are asking the question, where is he who was born the king? Where is he? Why isn't he here? Why isn't he bailing things out? Why isn't he doing? Why isn't he changing? Why do I have this problem in my life? He is the king, and the scripture tells us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's the king of redemption. He is the king who has come so that you can be born again, so that your and my sins can be forgiven, 
so that we can have eternal celestial fellowship with our Heavenly Father. We see the coming of the Magi to worship Christ. And most likely they came later than either our Hallmark cards or our nativity scenes portray. But nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, we see in this, and I'll give you, I'll show you why. In verse 11, there's the word house and there's the word child that's used. And house, the word that is in the original language, is a physical oikia, a physical house like we would think of. It's not a manger. It's not a stable. And the word child that is used in that section refers to probably more what we would consider a toddler than an infant. Okay, So most likely, it's at least a couple of months difference. But they come and they, they come into this, this town, this little village. They find probably a little house, this little family. They find this little boy. And in that, they bring their gigantic gifts, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Fitting of a king. Look at verses 7 and 8. Herod attempts to manipulate the Magi. And again, Herod was a, a power-broken politician uh, like few others in history. But we forget, or at least Herod forgot, he was dealing with wise men, right? And so in verses 8 and, and 9, or 7 and 8, he attempts to manipulate the Magi. He wants to know where the child is so that he can worship them, and worship him too. Can, can you just um, you know, visualize how sappy this guy sounded when he did that? I mean, I just feel like, you know, it was just running off his tongue when he was saying that. Oh, I want to worship him too. Yeah, I love the, the, the nativity movie that came out about 10 years ago. The Irish actor Kieran Hines plays, plays uh, Herod, and I think he's the best of the worst Herods ever. He just, he's got him down to, to a T. Oh, we want to worship him too as he you know, winks at his son, you know, and sends the signal. He didn't want to worship him. He wanted to butcher him. He wanted to kill him. And he thinks that he can dupe the wise men, but again, thank God, they're wise men. And they don't get duped by him. And he actually outwit, outwits them. But when he finds out he's been outwitted, does he lose graciously? Not so much, does he? This is the type of guy that if you, you know, had to play chess with Herod, you just lost every time. You just made sure going into it, you lost every time because if you didn't lose, you lost, right? And so his response is to send his soldiers to eradicate all of these children in Bethlehem, two years of age and younger, in order to make sure that nobody possibly will escape. And he got the name the Butcher of Bethlehem as a result of that. The Lord of the Rings trilogy, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, in the movie The Return, or the book The Return of the King, you see Lord Denethor, right? He's the steward of Gondor. And he, if, if there's somebody that comes close to Herod, it's Denethor, right? He's a bit out there, he's crazy, he's jealous, um, he's evil to the core, and he is fearful of the news of the coming king, Aragorn. He's fearful. He doesn't want to. He's a steward. That's all he is, is a steward. But in his mind, he is king. And he's going to keep his power as long as he possibly can. Third, we see, why was there an inevitable clash between these two kings? Well, they were a, a, about as different as oil and water, right? It mix about as well as that. Two kings of two rival kingdoms were about to clash. The rival, rival kingdoms attempting to gain the, the same territory will ultimately clash. You can only put off peace treaties and detente for so long, and after a while, somebody has to win. That's just the way power politics are played out. And Herod has been described as a, a madman who murdered his own family and just about anybody that crossed his path. He was called the evil genius of the Judean nation. He was prepared to commit any crime in order to gratify his unbounding ambition. He was the greatest builder in Jewish history. He was known for his colossal building projects throughout Judea. Even the second temple, the expansion thereof, was part. 
in Jesus Christ, we know that he was a carpenter, but we don't know of a single building project that he was involved in. He never wrote a book. He never led an army. He never founded a college. And unlike the usurper Herod, Jesus was prophesied to be wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace, who would rule eternally on the throne of his father, King David. What would happen? A conflict would happen. Herod represented Satan's kingdom and the kingdom of this world. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of heaven, and there would obviously be conflict. Herod sought out this conflict. Rarely in the annals of history uh, have a conflict between two kings seemed so utterly stacked by one against the other. Herod, as I said earlier, was crafty. He was cruel. He was capable. He was filled with power, possessions, and prestige, and a really good dose of paranoia. He had an arsenal of soldiers and firepower at his disposal, and he was facing a little boy, a baby, who was held only in the safety and security of the arms of his loving mother. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible tells us God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God's power, the Bible tells us, is made perfect in our weakness. The Bible says that some trust in uh, chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Friend, nasty old Herod didn't stand a chance. All those chariots, all those soldiers, all that power, he didn't stand a chance. Because this was God the Father's battle. Make sure you don't respond to the kingship of Christ over your life as Herod did. The question that every single one of us is forced to ask this Christmas Sunday morning is, who's the king of your life? Who's the king of your life? Are you like Herod, going to rule your own life, going to consolidate your power, going to do what you want to do? If that's the case, you see, you aren't really all that different from Herod. You may feign a, a, a bit of shock or protest of anger towards me and say, well, Chris, I, I would never kill my own family members. I would never slaughter scores of innocent children. I would never... I don't know as though we know what we would ever do, put in whatever situation we might be put in. And that really drives to where our hearts are and what our heart condition is outside of Christ. As I said earlier, and I was joking, there's a bit of Scrooge in all of us. There's really a bit of Herod in all of us too, isn't there? Willingness to manipulate, willingness to control, willingness to use other people. Maybe we don't murder with a, with a tool or an object, but we murder in our minds how we think of other people. We need a great big infusion of God in our lives, and that's what Christ came to do. Make sure you demonstrate a different type of faith than Herod did. Wait, wait, preacher. Herod demonstrated faith? Herod didn't have any faith, right? Oh, he had a type of faith that we see all too common today. Herod believed that there would be a king. He believed that this king would come and rule. He believed that what the Old Testament scriptures had to say, but he did not want his life commanded by what the Bible had to say. He used the Bible. He was afraid of what was in the scripture. He knew that there was going to be an, an eternal destiny, but he wasn't preparing for it. He was trying to put it off as long as he could. He was trying to control and manipulate so that he could do what he thought he could do until... There was no more time. Friend, the Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you need Christ, indeed, to turn to Christ. You, you think to yourself, oh, I'm in perfect health. I'm young. I'm whatever. You may think that in your mind, and you are not guaranteed tomorrow. You need Christ today. That is why the Savior came. To say that the two kings, Herod and King Jesus, merely cross paths is way too mild. According to the fundamental laws of physics, the force of impact depends upon the speed and direction, right? Jesus and Herod were moving fast on a collision course. Herod represented the popular perspective on power. Get it, keep it, use it. 
King Jesus was born in Bethlehem where all the sacrificial lambs were born. I think he was born, and I think that the shepherds who first saw him were the, the shepherds who, who actually watched the temple sacrifice sheep at Migdal Elder. I think that they were the first ones to see that they were going to be put out of a job. Because the great one-time eternal sacrifice, the Lamb of God, the real Lamb of God, was born. Friend, Jesus came to earth for a single purpose, to demonstrate to you and me God's outrageous love. Whereas Herod yielded power, hate, self-protection, anger, whatever else, fear, intimidation, Jesus Christ came forward with God's amazing love and grace. Amen. Well, fourth and finally, and I'll wrap it up in just a couple minutes, how do we root out the inevitable influence of Herod, which I would really say is not Herod, but it's sin in our lives? Well, let me ask you this. Which king are you following? Which king are you following? Accept into your own life the true king of Christmas, the Lord Jesus Christ. We accept the true king when we give our lives to Christ. We turn to him. Repent and believe. Turn from your sin, turn to Christ. Accept fully and freely what Christ has done for you. Reject any idea that you bring an iota of righteousness to God's judgment table. Amen. Throw yourself completely at the mercy of, of Christ and upon the mercy of Christ, and my friend, you will have everything of all eternity. Amen. Remember those four items that Herod struggled with? that we all, too, outside of Christ struggle with? Power, possessions, prestige, paranoia, power. Power loses its grip when we humbly defer to the King of Kings. Possessions, well, when we understand that not a single thing we have is our own, but it's God's. And we are simply stewards of what God has allowed us to have. Prestige has no pull when you are living to please God. When you recognize every success, every accomplishment is just another opportunity to praise God for his goodness to you. Paranoia, it flies out the window when God is for us and we ask who then can be against us. Pastor Clifford Stewart of Louisville, Kentucky, this is 30 years ago, sent his parents a microwave oven one Christmas. They were from rural eastern Kentucky and he, he, he recounted the experience once and told this. He said they were, they were excited. Now they too would be a part of the instant generation. And when my dad unpacked the microwave and plugged it in, literally within seconds, the microwave transformed two smiles into just two frowns. Even after looking at the directions, they couldn't make it work. Two days later, my mother was playing bridge with a friend and confessed her inability to get the microwave oven to even boil water. When her friend questioned her a little bit further about it, she said to get this darn thing to work, I really don't need better directions. I just need my, my son to come along with the gift. When God gave the gift of salvation, he didn't send a complicated booklet of directions. He sent his son, who was the gift. Reevaluate your life at Christmas to make sure that you are serving the true king of Christmas. Over 30 years after his birth, the Savior once told his disciples how they could best honor him. In one of the most riveting, hard-hitting passages of the scripture, Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these, you do this unto me. He also said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You want to demonstrate Christ in a fallen, sinful, Herod-filled world? Uh, follow the other king. Follow Christ. Amen. Let's go back to where I began with Dr. Zeus and how the Grinch stole Christmas. On that fateful evening, the Grinch steals all of Whoville's Christmas <laughs> gifts. And that's where we always point to David, because he, he, he's got that maniacal look that kind of looks like David, you know? We say, yeah, you would really enjoy doing that, wouldn't you? He never really says anything, which makes it just confirm all the more in our minds. <laughs> and he anticipates how distressed they will be when they discover that their Christmas is gone. Because the old Grinch, he associates Christmas with what? 
the gifts, the presents, the stocking, the, the roast beast, right? All of that. And what happens when he looks down upon Whoville and he sees that they're all outside singing Kumbaya, right? They're all holding hands outside the village as the star is rising or as the sun is rising and they are singing and joyful and the Grinch soon discovers that maybe Christmas means a little bit more than gifts, right? But truly, Christmas at its deepest meaning is about gifts. It's about the greatest gift, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ that came so that you and I could be saved to extinguish the influence of the wicked king, to overcome with the true king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Two kings, two kingdoms came into conflict that original Christmas. One kingdom and its king represents sin, self, and strife. The other, King Jesus, the Savior, who has brought salvation, security, and your sanctification. Choose today which king you'll follow. Let's pray. Father, this Christmas Sunday morning, we rejoice in your goodness to us in sending us your Son, our Savior, so that we can be born again. Lord, we pray that even now, if there would be those who are here who don't know you, that, Lord, that they would humble their hearts, not make it more proud like Herod did when he had the opportunity, but to humble our hearts before you and to let Christ the Savior come in and change us for all of eternity. We thank you for the most awesome and precious gift that was ever given, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's through his name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen.